is uh, as well as full start. Uh, What's up, guys? It's Caleb with Stain and Sale Experts here live. We're waiting on Stephen to get here. He's a couple minutes behind having a little technical difficulties, but we're about ready to roll. And uh, so let's hang out and uh, get ready for Stephen to come on when he gets in the, in the backstage area. We will bring him on. But today I want to talk about, um, let's see. Lessons learned in the staining business, stuff you need to know if you're on the fence about starting a stain company or wood, wood care company. And uh, so I want you guys to get your questions ready and be be mindful of, of uh, what you can ask. Because Stephen, um, he's been a good friend of mine for several years now. He uses our stain and I get to watch the projects he does. And he just does absolutely beautiful projects. And a lot of you don't know it, but Stephen quit a pretty prestigious career, a very high paying career to pursue the staining field for certain reasons. And I'm going to let Stephen tell the story, um, but it's very important to listen and because uh, it might just be something that, that you might want to do. So uh, get your questions ready. And um, that's all I got for you right now. Easy Stain is based in Memphis, Tennessee. So they're, they're neighbors of ours. They're about four hours to the west of us. And um, they, uh, they're a family business. They stain a lot of fences and decks. I think you guys have probably all seen their work um, on a regular basis because they're a frequent flyer in the Facebook Staining University group. So if you guys don't mind, give us a shout out to where, where you are, or where you're from, and go ahead and get those questions piling in here. Tell us your name, where you're from. I see we got quite a few eyeballs watching us. Looks like the majority of you are on Facebook and the rest of you guys are on YouTube. So uh, give us a shout out. Let us know where you're from, what your questions are. I'm Truth Seeker, Devil Dog. Let's see here. Good afternoon, Truth Seeker. Don't know who you are. Can't see what your name actually is. But and then we got Devil Dog must be a Semper Fi guy, Marine Corps. Uh, let's see who else have we got. I don't know who this one is. It says, what's up, brother? What's up? Glad you made it. What's your name? Let us know. And then Omaha, Nebraska. There's a few guys that I know that that could be. It might be somebody else. Glad you've made it. And let's see. Fort Worth, Texas. Justin, what's up, man? Let's see here. All right. Steven's about to get in. Cell phone, talking to Steven. Let's see here. We got Justin Menensis up there in Omaha. Great guy, little bitty guy. If you've ever met him, he's as big as Paul Bunyan. And uh, P. Denny, they're Dennis from Michigan, Metro Detroit area. Uh, Dennis, what's the weather like up there? Are you guys still staining? There's Justin. Steven is working on this. He's getting, entering the broadcast studio. I'm going to send him another link. Ah, there's the stain man, Kenny Dugan. He has a visitor on this podcast several times. Glad he made it. Looks like we got a lot of guys maybe taking the day off today. So let us, give us a weather report wherever you're from. Nashville um, is sunny, clear skies. We had rain this morning about four o'clock. I got a little sleet and mixed, mixed rain on the windshield uh, this morning but it cleared out of here pretty fast. And I think I talked to uh, Chattahoochee Stain and Seal this morning. They got about two hours of rain first thing this morning. So, um, you know, I'll give you a little tip. We we would generally call and talk to, for instance, I'd call and talk to Walt Dennis and say, hey, Walt, what's the weather doing in Dallas today? Because you whatever Dallas gets today, we're going to get tomorrow. Um, so you should find a friend in the staining business who, you know, whose weather will come to you, or you should find somebody and give them a report. So, uh, so stain man, Kenny Dugan says he's got an overcast today, just about guaranteed. We'll have overcast tomorrow. And Steven is in, let's add him to the stream. Let's see if we can get him in here. Steven, I don't know if you're muted or anything, but can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, you have excellent audio. Everybody give me a thumbs up if Steven, if you can hear him, but it's uh, loud and clear on our end. 
Ten four. What's up, man? How are you doing? Oh man, another day in the neighborhood, enjoying this beautiful weather. Yeah, what's the temperature there? Is is, is it? It's, I, I think it's in the sixties. I haven't even checked to be honest with you, but I think it's in the sixties. Good deal. Good deal. Well, man, you drew a big, big crowd. You got a big crowd. Everybody wanted to come see you today. So glad you made it. I think it's the beard, man. <laughs> I shaved my beard off this morning, so I, I, I didn't sent you all for that. You should take care of it. Well, I didn't want to compete with you when we, when, you know, I want to be respectful. <laughs> I hear you. Yes, man. So introduce yourself. Tell us who who Easy Stain is. Tell us about Stephen E. Step and Easy Stain. So uh, I'm Stephen E. Step. I'm the co-owner, <laughs> excuse me, of Easy Stain. Uh, me and my wife own it together. It's a family business. Uh, we started back in 2016. Uh, I used to be a pipeline welder, so I traveled around the country doing pipelines and compressor stations. Uh, I've been welding pretty much my entire life. My father owned a welding company, and uh, he's been pipeline welding for about 20 years. Uh, I had multiple jobs before that. I worked for BNSF, the railroad. I worked for a steel company. But uh, that was where I thought I was going to be the rest of my life was uh, being a pipe welder. I made excellent money. Uh, we made close to a quarter million dollars a year. Uh, but I had to travel to get it. I mean, I had to travel all around the country to get it and uh, my family traveled with me for a while but then um, I had to start outsourcing work when the gas prices went down and everybody was hoarding their gas so um, my family came back to Tennessee because my wife basically told me if you're going to travel while we're traveling we're just going back to the house where we know somebody so uh, they went back home and I think I traveled for about six months by myself and I mean them traveling with me for five years and then me traveling by myself it was a no-go um, my little girl was having issues in middle school. I'm sure everybody remembers middle school. You're trapped between an adult and a child and your emotions are all over the place and you don't know how to deal with those. So she was having some, some mental clarity issues and um, we just chose to basically give that up. I mean, my, like I said, my, my father was in the game for a long time and, and uh, not to say he, he, you know, left and, and didn't do anything with us. But I mean, that, that still left a hole in me because my father wasn't there all the time. So anyway, I, I chose not to do that with my children. And uh, we came back. So I gave up a $250,000 a year job for about a $30,000 a year job. And uh, so I had to find some supplemental income somewhere. And that's where staining came about. I'm sure like everybody goes to YouTube University is where you learn just about everything nowadays. Mm -hmm. So uh, we went, or excuse me, I went to there. I was going back and forth to Memphis uh, for a company. I was a welding supervisor, and uh, it was my little brother and three other guys. We would carpool back and forth. And um, so on my days where I didn't drive, I was constantly looking up things to do and, and ways to make income. And I came across a company that was offering staining uh, training. So I uh, went to Texas and went through the training uh, did that and and you know i just kept saying over and over i want to be my own boss i don't want to work for anybody uh, i'm tired of this and i want to spend more time with my family even coming back i still was working you know 12 hours a day or more to try to keep steady income coming in that we were used to we, we tried to hold the lifestyle as long as we could but anyway I uh, came across staining, went to the training. Uh, I had sold all my welding equipment. Uh, I had a truck, well machine, everything. You know, I was a one-man company. And um, so sold all that, started buying some little staining equipment here and there, a little generator, an airless sprayer, uh, things like that, a little yard wagon cart. And my, my father raised me to be very resourceful. So, uh, you know, we tried to do as minimal as possible and, you know, at that time we were working out of a minivan. And uh, so we did that for a while. Uh, my children were 10 and 11 at the time and they worked with us. My father raised me, my mother and father raised me to have a work ethic at a, at a very young age. And uh, I kept saying that I kept telling my children, I'm, I'm not raising punks. I'm raising productive members of society. So uh, we put them to work with us and try to teach them as much as we can. Uh, that's kind of how me and you kind of cross paths mm -hmm. about, I don't know, two years into it. But uh, I was still working and my wife was running the company full time. <laughs> 
uh, we didn't have a lot of income coming in. I think the first year we made somewhere around twenty thousand dollars in sales um, the first year, and so I mean, it, it just gradually grew over that time. Talking to you, you you kind of gave me some marketing tips and techniques um, on how to uh, get out there, call different fence builders, and so I did. Man, I would call as many fence builders as I could find real estate agents, uh, as many people that were in the uh, fence building business or housing business or anything to do with anything we could help. Uh, and, and our business could help. We just started making calls and we're, we're five and a half years into it now and we're doing pretty good. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, let me back it up a little bit. And I'm going to I'm going to start with a comment that Kenny made right here. It is my biggest impression of the E-Steps family first. So when you started this, when you when you quit the, the big job and you decided I want to put family first, what was that like? What was the decision like when you made that? And then what is that like today? Because obviously a lot of people will quit the job to spend more time with their kids and then they end up working 100 hours a week for themselves. And so that it goes full circle. So tell me about that. Right. Well, I mean, uh, I started a company or excuse me, we started the company and, and we wanted it to be, I had this big idea. I wanted it to be a multi-million dollar company and we were going to stay in every fence that went up in this part of town and in Memphis and Jackson. And I mean, it, it, the, the more we got into it, now my children work with us every single day. They were homeschooled. My little girl just graduated. She actually turns 18 this year, <clears throat> but they work with us every single day. They work every job, which that is a blessing in itself um, to go from not, not being around a lot to actually working with them every day. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm a stickler and you know, they're teenage kids. So I mean, everybody has their issues with that, but we, we always put family first, man, no matter what it, it did not matter. Uh, we would sacrifice a job. We would sacrifice money. We would do whatever we had to, to be able to have that, freedom and to be able to have our children there and to be able to be the influence for them. Because I mean, as you know, you are who you hang around. So that's the only thing as parents we can control is, you know, their influence while they're with us. Now I can't control when they go out into the world, but that's one of the reasons we brought them and homeschooled them at home is because of that. You know, I couldn't control who my kids were around and it was, they, I was a, a very bad child growing up. I was in boys' homes, or excuse me, in a, in a detention center by the time I was 15 years old, and I was going down a wrong path until I turned my life around and gave my life to the Lord. <clears throat> but to, to have that freedom to be able to say, family's first, I'm, I'm not necessarily chasing a dollar, I'm chasing the freedom to be able to have that with my children we are to the point where we need to hire people but i mean my children work with us every day so we have to take that into consideration i mean yeah for sure so what do you think the long-term impact on your on your family tree on your kids um what do you think that impact is because of the decision you made oh i'm that's it's going to impact them greatly uh i mean it negatively affected me with my father not being in my you know, he was in my life, but I mean, he wasn't at home. He wasn't there to, you know, to show me daddy things, I guess you would say. And, you know, to show me what not to do. He just showed me how to work. And I give him all the credit for that because he did show me how to work. And that's what I'm doing to my children as well. But I'm also showing them different life lessons as well. I am I mean, I ain't perfect by any means. Nobody is. But I'm learning as I go. The different things that I learn, I try to instill in them on a daily basis. Uh, but as far as the impact, that's, I mean, I mean, I can't speak for the future, but I sure hope it impacts them greatly. Awesome, man. I think that's a big deal. I think a lot of guys looking to get into a new business or they want to do it for that very reason. It's cool to see that you, you wanted to do it for that reason and you, and you did it. Um, that's, that's an awesome thing, man. So what, um, so when you started staying in fences and you, and you, when did you know that this is going to be something that sticks this, you know, cause a lot of people will try a bunch of different things. When did you know that staining was the right choice? I'll be honest. I didn't, uh, I, I didn't realize that probably until the last couple of years, I, it was a fight to get to where we are. Um, 
And, and, you know, I called you, like you said, we've been friends for many years and I would call you and, and complain, Hey man, what's going on? It's, you know, September, October, and we have no business. What do I need to do? What What's going on? And, and it, it took time to put in, I guess the footwork, it took time and, and patience to be able to build up a reputation with builders to build up. I mean, I'm not a big social media guy. I do all of our social media and I still suck at it, but I mean, I just hadn't got to the point where I would pay somebody yet, but I I know I knew it was a need in our area. There was a lot of fences that were falling down. Uh, builders weren't necessarily staining left and right, and most most builders don't want to stain anyway. They'll tell you right off the bat when you call them, man, I've stained a couple, but I sure don't want to do it. I hate staining. And they make more as they go on and get more fence jobs. Excuse me. But – um I guess in the last year or so, I've, I've seen uh, an, in, an increase in, in, um, in our workflow and, in, and uh, getting more people involved in, you know, protecting their fence and, and trying to educate our customers on that fact. You know, uh, most people think that, uh, hey, a cedar fence, it's cedar. It's going to last forever. And that's not necessarily true. I mean, it's it, in eight months, a year, it's going to start turning on you. So we have to explain that to them, the nuance of that. But um That makes sense. I like it, man. I like it. Yeah, I remember you calling me with those phone calls, and sometimes it would be uh, something like, "Hey, it's uh, I don't know if you realize this, but school's out of vacation for two weeks, man. You're going to get a little slump, and or it's spring break or something. And and uh, once you've been in it a while, you start to you start to learn those highs and lows that come. But uh, man, you said your your Facebook's not that great. I was looking at it today, and I'll be honest, you probably got one of the best that I've seen for a stain contractor because it's straight into the point. It's uh, it's just one after another, just beautiful stain job. So I think that that probably gets you a pretty good bit of business. Yeah. We appreciate it, man. Yeah. Well, yeah. So cool that you do that yourself. That's how I started, man. Doing the Facebook. I still do a ton of the Facebook and uh, that's the way it goes. What do you think? Um, I mean, where do you want to go with it? I know we got some folks here watching, so I want them to take advantage of, the fact that they got you here. So if you guys got some questions for Steven, ask them. Um, so let's get that going, get the questions coming in. Um, and I'm going to say hello to two more people here. I hope I get this name right. It's Jory Polita. He's in Vask Tech. I don't know where that is, but it's probably nowhere around here. So yeah, I have no clue. Glad, glad to have him here. And then here's another Facebook user says amazing family and all the right reasons. So that's, that's cool. Um, yeah, for sure. What do you what do you think is um, maybe something that's lacking in the stain in business? What do you think what do you think is is really lacking or holding the stain industry back from getting more mainstream, like say an electrician or a plumber? I would say it, customer education is what I would say. Uh, I, I mean, I'm the type of guy you give me something to do, I'm going to learn everything I can about it. Um, so it's it's educating yourself to be able to educate your customers for sure but just to be able to get that word. And we live in a tech world. I mean, I know social media is a big thing and I appreciate the words you say about my, our, our Facebook. Uh, but I mean, as far as that, I, I just think that being able to educate your customers and even the builders, you know, some people don't know that, or some builders don't know that uh, this type of stain exists or, you know, the quality of this stain, they just think they go to Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever and, and buy a, a low quality stain and, and kind of get the same results that we're putting out. Uh, not to pat ourselves on the back, but we do a, a really good job and we try to be, you know, very thorough in quality. My wife is quality control and she yeah. is a stickler yeah. for quality control. And we go above and beyond for every customer, but to educate our customers on that, because they may see, you know, driving down the road in their subdivision, they may see that uh, we call them weekend warriors. They do it for beer money or whatever. They stained a fence for $500. That should have been a $3,500 job and they're using inferior products and they, you come to their house and give them a $3,500 bid and they think they're going to get the same results. So it's, it's kind of, that that's one thing that I see is lacking is the customer education part. Education. That makes perfect sense. What, what do you think? Let, I'm just going to ask you some basic questions and you probably get this too. When, so Miss Jones just called you. They just built a fence. It's done today. When are you going to stain it in Memphis, well, Tennessee? 
go ahead and get on the books now because it's crazy. I'm telling you, even this time of year. But we typically tell people two to three weeks. Uh, if it's cedar, we're not, you can pretty much stain cedar. If it's dry when you put it up, you can pretty much stain it right the day you put it up. But we have to worry about the the moisture in the wood. So that's kind of what we tell them is, is, you know, three to four weeks is typically what we wait. And like the summertime, we might wait two to three weeks. But uh, we typically get them on the books sometimes even before the fence is built uh, mm -hmm. through some of our builders. Yep, that's what we do. So let's see here. Tell me, tell me about your stain sprayer setup. I, I never go over much gear because I'm not, I don't really, I'm not impressed with it, but tell us, tell us how you started, what your sprayer system looked like and tell us what you use today. Well, we'll get a bunch of, a bunch of flack off this because I know every guy is different, but like I said, my dad raised me to be resourceful. So um, when we started, we started with a little bitty uh, power horse generator uh, with a, with a yard wagon, a uh, hundred foot extension cord, a hundred foot of hose and an uh, airless sprayer from Harbor Freight. And I'll be honest with you, we still have that sprayer and use it every job to this day. Five and a half years later, we have no issues with it. Uh, my philosophy is they're kind of like big lighters. I mean, you can just use it till it's broken, then you can throw it away and get another one. They're so cheap. But uh, but that's kind of what we do. We Every job, typically, we run two people spraying. Uh, we have two airless sprayers that are the Harbor Freight sprayers. I mean, I know guys, you know, knock them or whatever, but they've been great machines for us. Uh, th now, we have the machine, but we upgrade the hoses. We upgrade the wands, uh, guns, and the tips and everything else. But as far as the machine itself, it's the regular Harbor Freight sprayers, man. They, they've worked great for us. Uh, I can't. I can't complain at all about those. Hey, man, they're probably made in the same factory as a Graco, if you want to be honest, because I think they're all made in China. So that's probably true. It is. It is what it is. If it's working, yep. it's working. So that's that's pretty cool. I've heard a lot of guys do that. They'll buy a two hundred dollar sprayer and throw it away when it breaks and get another one. So um, there's something to be said about that. So let's see that you answered that question. You started with it and it's it's lasted you forever so why do you use an airless and not like a 12 volt system or a hvlp setup something like that well those, those have its place too i mean it just depends i ha we have those uh i'll be honest we went to the training in texas and i'm a fabricator i've been a fabricator my whole life so i just kind of took mental notes when we were walking through and looking at the different equipment that they were offering and uh, I came home and built a bucket top system myself and uh, a 12 volt bucket top system with a lawnmower battery. And uh, that we used that for probably, I don't know, six months or a year. And uh, then we, you know, slowly upgraded that system. But I, like I said, each has its own. We use a HVLP sprayer sometimes on decks if we're using solids or uh, just specific jobs. It's, it's all job, you know, dependent. But uh, I mean, airless, I just, to me, it's a lot quicker uh, you, you, with the atomization. You don't have to worry about a lot of overspray a lot of times. Uh, and, and that's just, like I said, it's all job dependent. But Yeah, man. Looks like somebody's looking out for you here. It says he should also mention that he cleans the filters after every job and changes them frequently, which helps prolong the life of the machine. Is that yeah. is that Marissa? Probably. <laughs> Probably. Tell us about that. What's, what's your um, what's your everyday um, so we, we don't do it every job, but it, it it also depends on what color we're using. So if we're using like a light honey or a cedar tone, uh, something that doesn't have a ton of pigments, uh, I might let it, you know, go a job or two or something like that. But uh, typically I have a, a little jar. I fill it full of degreaser uh, and I'll take the filters out, put them in there, shake it up really good and, and leave it until the next day, the next job, whatever. And uh, that's that seems to work for us. I mean, when when the filters go bad, I change them, but I just keep using them. Like I said, be as resourceful as possible and, and hold as much of those profits as possible instead of just, you know, continually buying new here and there. Yeah. We just keep using what we've got. Yeah, that's something we got to work on in our company. We tend to uh, let filters go a little too long and we need to be cleaning them and swapping them out after every job. Talk to me a little bit about um, how important it is for your wife to be a, a, a cheerleader for you or a, uh, or a good teammate or on the same page, how, how do you guys pull on the same end of the rope to make things happen? How has that helped your business? 
Well, it's up greatly. She's not a cheerleader by no means. She is a co-owner, and she is good at what she does. Um, it's t- it took her a while to be able to uh, feel comfortable around customers. As you can see, I'm a talker. You've known me for years. I'll talk a year off. Uh, and, but that took a little work as well. But as far as being on the same page, it is – I mean, don't get me wrong. We still butt heads on certain things for sure. That I mean, it's a marriage. You're working with each other. I mean, a lot of people say if you work with your spouse, that's the worst thing you can do. I disagree. It's not mm-hmm. the worst thing you can do, especially if you build that relationship. Um, but uh, to be able to be on the same page, and it, that doesn't matter if it's your wife or whoever you're working with, teammates, period, uh, that means a lot. I mean, that that makes the job go a lot smoother, a lot less headache. Um, so, I mean, that's – but she she's awesome. Uh, she she's she really is. I I can't complain at all about any of that. I mean, she's watching, so I can't do that at all. No, I'm yeah. just playing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, no she, I, she's awesome. I th- so so. Tell me about this. You said she's a stickler for uh, for quality control. You and you can be broad with this. You can talk about when you first started or compared to it is now. But what are those? What are those top? probably five or 10 things that stain contractors are probably going to miss on the job site. That's going to affect their quality control that you'd recommend that they pay extra special attention to for a, for a perfect job site. Well, I'll tell you mine. Uh, and like I said, she's quality control. I'm typically about speed. I want to get in and out as quick as possible. We make the most money when we do that. So I've always been to get in, get it, get it done, get it going as fast as we possibly can. And when you do that, you typically miss something. I mean, you, it's it's always been the case. So, um, I mean, things like that, trying to slow down, take a deep breath, you know, pay attention to what you're doing. Uh, shadow boxes are pretty bad about, you know, the underneath rails not getting hit, uh, getting hit in the cracks because we hit every nook and cranny. Um, but, I mean, paying attention to detail is – a, a big deal. I mean, that can make or break you because in social media now and with these phones, I mean, people could take a picture of where you messed up and you might have, you know, not paying attention. You might have left a little spot on a piece of concrete. Well, that's all that customer knows is you left that piece on that concrete. You may do it on every job for all they know. So they're going to take a picture and potentially, you know, bash you or talk about it on online and that can affect your bottom line. So, um, I mean, taking care of things like that and just, like I, I know you put your um, your book out there, um, your field guide, and I mean that helps. When when you look at that field guide, it kind of tells you from the time you leave the shop or you know show up at the job to the time you walk away from that job. It gives you every detail to look for, everything you need to be paying attention to. Um, but I mean, and, and, and our, we don't have a field guide, but you know we we have things that we put in place and we try to do every single job. Uh, whether it be, you know, make sure the where it meets up to the house that there's no stain, make sure you're either wetting it down or if we plastic. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you another thing. What, st- being like that can m- cost you money because um, we, we've actually left the job. This just happened a couple of months back. Uh, we wrapped in a, um, an air conditioner unit with plastic because the fence was uh, surrounding it. And uh, we forgot to remove that plastic. If we'd have had the field guide, maybe we'd have followed that step by step. But we end up having to, you know, claim that on our insurance because th- it burned the condenser up. So that's a step that we didn't take that it, we slacked in. And my wife wasn't on that job. So it, it, maybe she'd have been there. We'd have got it. But anyway, I mean, that can cost you to those things. So Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm a stickler for walking the job over and over and over. So at the end, I'll usually walk the job two or three times. And then when I'm done and we all go back to the truck, I'll say, Hey, let's go walk it one more time. And usually that fourth or fifth walk around, that's when you come back with a hammer or you left, you know, you found a tip that you left laying on the ground or a tarp, or there's a dadgum ladder leaned against the house. How did we miss that? Or, Oh yeah. Or, We've uh, had to go back to and, and uh, hit a spot, you know, like we missed like a little bitty spot and the customer walked the job. We might, we might've been there late at night or something or, you know, right at the, right at dusk and we missed a little spot and they'll call us back. So, I mean, that cost you time, time mm-hmm. and you're missing on money. I mean, yeah. And reputation too. That's for sure. So what is your method for, so let's take this question from John. He's got two questions. He's over in Charlotte. Um, stain contractor. And I think he's fairly new to the game. I don't think he's been doing it as long as you. So his question is, uh, what's your method for fin staining when 
close to the house. I guess he's talking about cutting in. Do you do you tarp mask it or or do you just pre rent the brick? Well, it it depends on uh, what the what's on the house. So if it's siding, uh, we might just put some degreaser on, spray on, and move. You know, just cut in. But about ninety percent of the time, we're cutting in by hand. We'll cut in, you know, three boards on either side. And uh, there's, I mean, there's four of us on the job. There's two people spraying and my children, two helpers, and they've been doing this long enough that they pretty much know where to go, what to do. So one one person will get one side of the house and the other person will get the other side of the house and they'll cut them in. And it typically goes extremely fast. I mean, it's by the time, if you start in the corner and move up, they're typically done. I mean, it takes 20 minutes to cut in by hand. But And if it's a stucco house or uh, they have that slurry on the bricks, uh, a lot of houses around here are like uh, they have brick and then they have like a white slurry. Well, you can't get anything on that because it ain't coming off. So uh, we'll, we'll plastic that up, spray. You know, that's it, it's a give and take there because if you cut in or if you take time to put plastic up, it's it's time either way. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. what's your opinion on quality when it comes to doing the water thing versus in the degreaser versus cutting in by hand? You think one's better than the other? No, I mean, it's, it, y'all make a great product, man. It doesn't matter if you're cutting in by hand or if you're spraying. If you saturate those boards, it's an outstanding product. Yeah, so I wasn't really alluding to that as much as I was, and, and this is going against, you know, the degreaser method, but I find that we tend to have less callbacks if we just cut in by hand, and that's, uh, that's for us. Of course, our guys are trying to get as many done as they can. Right. I'm not on wood, but we, we yeah. haven't had callbacks. We haven't had many callbacks at all in five and a half years. Mm-hmm. We maybe have had a handful of callbacks. So yeah. So that so that taking time is is paying off for sure. So another question John asked is since you don't do much social media, and I would I would I would say that you actually do quite a bit of social media. Uh, but what are your marketing strategies? He's asking. Uh pro- I'll be honest, for the last two and a half years, we haven't had to market at all. I haven't put an ad out. Uh, I don't do, I, I, I used uh, the marketplace for a while, just trying to use as many of resources as I can that were free. And uh, I would make a post with a before and after picture and, you know, kind of put some wording in there and uh, just put that out to as many of the little resale sites and yard sale sites that I could. And we got quite a bit of jobs there, but the biggest thing, man, is building rapport with your, with builders. Uh, we follow behind, I think about 10 different builders now in our area between Memphis and Jackson and, uh, outstanding builders, man. But it, you just spend time talking to them, you know, working with them, uh, doing things like that. And and when we first started, we put a lot of foot traffic in, uh, we got business cars, door hangers, things like that. And uh, like I said, we worked out of a minivan, so we would pull into a subdivision that we haven't been in and open both side doors and hand the kids uh, cards and door hangers. And they would go to every uh, fence that either we could stain or we could, you know, rest, restore and and, and uh, make it look good for them. So uh, we did that for a while, you know, just putting in foot traffic. But we would do that on like Saturday and, you know, most most people aren't doing that on Saturdays. So, uh, I mean, they see you out there hustling. They see you out, your, out there trying to, you know, grow your business. And a lot of people, they, they like that. Um, I'll be honest. We've got a lot of business because we are a family. And, you mm-hmm. know, we do work our kids. You would think it would be the opposite that people would be like, oh, they're using you know, child labor or slave labor. No, I mean, we explain our story typically to every every job we go on, if we talk to the customer, we're explaining our story. We tell them, you know, how we got into this, that we're trying to, you know, give a good work ethic to our children. And the way society is today with a lot of people not wanting to work, they eat that up. I mean, not, not that I'm, that's what I'm doing it for. I'm just, you know, talking, telling our story because I'm proud of it. But, uh, so, but anyway, we, we, we did that, but building rapport with your, um, with builders is a big thing. So calling everybody you can make it out to. So we go out to about, I don't know, about a hundred mile radius or so is what we do. And we're not trying to do like 40 jobs a day. We might do one job a day. We might get two. It's very rare that we do two jobs a day. We might do, you know, three or four jobs a week. I'm not, we're not trying to be out there killing ourselves because the point of starting this business is to have the freedom. I don't, you know, like I said, it, it, our mindsets have changed. Our perspective has changed as far as the multi-million dollar stain company to where we're just we're, we're trying to build slowly and organically and, uh, you know, teach our children that. And also to not have that 
uh, constant weight on us all the time. You know, we, we kind of want a different lifestyle. So, but, um, yeah, calling everybody, you know, like all the builders explaining what you do, explain the products, how you can help them, things like that. Uh, that, that right there will get you a lot of business. Yeah, I agree. Pretend like the internet doesn't exist. Do it the old way. So here's another quote right here from maybe, maybe your other half says happy wife, happy life. That's correct. That is got correct. A, got another one here. Love your knowledge. What's your fence cleaning method, man? Well, tell me about that. So when we first started, uh, I'm sure everybody's, you know, that has started a couple of years ago, they, they, it was bleach, sodium hypochlorite or yeah. We, so we bleached all oh, when we first started all the green fences and stuff like that. And, and people were oohed and odd over that, you know, because of the instant change. But the more we educated ourselves and things like that. Um, so what we do now, it kind of depends on the situation. But uh, if it has a uh, if it has a stain already on it or has a, had a previous stain, we, we use those wood cleaner. Um, and sometimes I might mix wood cleaner and eco cleaner. Uh, we'll spray it on typically a cup per gallon. Uh, if it's bad, we'll, we'll add a little bit more to it, half a cup per gallon or a cup and a half per gallon and, uh, let it dwell, pressure wash it off, use wood brightener and then, you know, come back and stain it. But, uh, typically gray fences, we just hit them with a, uh, the eco cleaner, then the brightener and come back and stain. It's not hard at all. Nice. Nice. Yeah. We used to do the same thing. Very similar to what we're doing. So here is, here's another one from John. And uh, he says he's tried with builders, tried to build that relationship with builders, but he rarely gets any interest. And I think they want to put the fence up and be done with it. They don't want to deal with sub and our standing and being tied to the job for weeks, man. I, I'll give a little insight on that one. I think if they don't want to be tied to the job, then don't, don't tie them to the job. You need to, instead of, the thing is a lot of guys that I think go after fence contractors, they, they try to entice the fence contractor by showing them you can make money by being friends with me. You can make money. But if you get a thousand dollar stain job, how much money are you going to give the fence contractor? You're going to give him a hundred bucks. You're going to give him 50 bucks. And is it really worth his time to deal with that? Probably not, but they'll do a whole, what I've found at least is they'll do a whole lot more for a favor. You know, oh, if, yeah. you just, if you be known that, hey, you're the stain guy, when they get asked, they'll go, oh, yeah, this call Easy Stain. They're right here in Memphis or call, you know, JJ's Power Washing or whatever, whatever the company name might be. They're going to remember you. But you just got to be remembered as the guy who stains. We don't we don't pay any kickbacks to any of our builders. We you don't know, either. If they, if they refer us, they refer us. I've tried the ones where you say, well, you can sub us out. And that kind of works a little bit. It's more of a pain um, for them and for us. And and when they expect you to, you know, hey, I'll send you work, you send me 10% kind of thing, that never lasts. Because 10% right. is not going to make a change in their world. You know, if you were paying them an extra $3,000 a month, they're probably going to start sending you some fence leads. But, you know, the it's, right. it's just the fence builders, just they they're so busy. You know, the best thing you can do is just make friends with them and be known. That, that's exactly what we do. Just, I mean, just be a good person. I mean, that's that's the main mm -hmm. thing. Don't go in with the mentality of, you know, I only want to make money. Build a relationship with that person, with with people. We we work behind one company and they're, it's a husband and wife. We work behind two companies and it's a husband and wife. And, and we're friends with the husband and the wife. I mean, the wife calls and they'll, you know, Hey, we need this. We need that. We, what, what do you charge for this? What do you think this, I mean, we've tried that as well with the sending, you know, a list of uh, uh, certain style of fences and what we would charge and then what they can charge too. I mean, some do some, some had done that, but most are just, you know, they're, they just pass our name along. Um, we have a company that wants to add us to every fence job, which is awesome. That's incredible. And we love those guys, but um I mean, it, you just be a good person, get involved in their life, ask about their children and really care about that. Don't don't just do it to be put on a facade. I mean, really care yeah. about them people and, and get invested in their life as well. And that, that will reap more benefits than you can actually think. Yeah, people people generally don't do business with you because they trust you. They generally do business with because you, you don't really trust somebody you just met. They they do business usually based off a of gut feeling or uh, because they know you if they know you and they like you they'll do business with you 
That's if right. You got, if you got web website and internet reviews and things to kind of back up what they're feeling, then you it's a go. Right. So we they, always do like Christmas presents. We do. Uh, we don't necessarily do birthday presents, but, but you know, you give. Hey, happy birthday, man! Hope you're having a good day. Whatever. Check in on them from time to time. Hey, man, hadn't heard from you in a while. What's going on with you? you know, I, you send me, you know, some customers or whatever. But how are you doing? How how's things going with your business? Uh, Christmas time rolls around. We give Christmas gifts. We, I mean, mm-hmm. we and we give Christmas gifts from the heart. We don't just go buy something. Typically, we make something. My wife's a, a great artist. Uh, and I like building things as well. So we'll, we'll build something. My mom makes homemade cheesecakes. We'll give them a cheesecake. I mean, things like that go a million miles, man, and do it from the kindness of your heart. Don't just do it. Like I said, to get business. Yep. I agree with that hundred percent. So Greg Townsend says he's building for the future. No one and none jobs is what he's been doing. That's, a, that's a good, good way to go about it. What are you using as for washing fences? Power washer or soft washer? That's from Justin Menitz up in uh, up in Nebraska. Yeah, uh, we use a, a pressure washer most of the time. Um, I don't like I said, soft washing is. I guess you could say at one point we were applying our chemicals with a soft wash system, but uh, those they were going around on the website there for a while or the Facebook page for a while. Those North Star. Uh, pumps that yeah, Kenny Dugan redone. Uh, we we have two mm-hmm. of those, and we redone one. And uh, I like using that. I mean, I just we just cleaned the house, and uh, I used it for the whole house, and uh, it, it's awesome. I like that thing. Uh, but we were downstreaming for a while. Um, but I, I mean, I like the the little twelve volt system to apply the chemical, let it dwell, then power wash it, and then apply the brightener with a twelve volt as well. Pump sprayer just takes too long. If it's a small job or a small deck or whatever, something like that, I'll use a pump up sprayer. But and you know, not not waste my time getting all the the equipment out. But uh, that that's our process. Yep, that sounds like a whole lot of other folks' process. Justin also says, how do we educate fence builders that we're benefiting? that, that we are benefiting from fence standards. Yeah. So I guess what he's asking is how to, how do you get, how do you sell fence builders on the idea that they also benefit from a stain job, even if they don't make a dime off of it? Just, just talk, just talk to them, man. Uh, br- break it down and, and everything, you know, tell them, I mean, you, you told me a long time ago, don't, don't hold nothing back. There's no sense in trying to hoard all your information. So just, you, you know, tell them. And I mean, that's that's hurt me a time or two, mm-hmm. but for the most part, it's helped us a hundred percent because they they know a hundred percent of your process. They know what you're doing. Uh, they know that it can help with their callbacks. You know, with the twisting and bowing. You know, depending on what uh, their warranty is or whatever with, or with their callbacks. But for the most part, just explaining to them. I mean, just setting them down yeah. or getting on the phone and talking to them. I think some visual cues is good too, and explain to them that hey, if 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 there's three f- houses in a row with a fence, and they all look like, you know like an old wore out fence, but but the one with you know Jackson Fence Company on it looks like a brand new fence, and it's nice and beautiful. That I mean, they're probably going to call your, they're they're going to get the number off of your fence because that makes sense. So I think that's, that's it. Now and we went to we actually had a no meeting oil. with fence builders and went to went to their facility yeah. and actually did a small demonstration to kind of educate them on what we did in our process as well. Yeah, here's another thing that I like to do. So when I was so I grew up in the fence business and the number one callback was um, warping and twisting. And so oils. So we took this this board here and we put one cc one milliliter of stain on the top of it right here. And then we cut it in half and then we show this to people, you know, that's one CC. That's a tiny amount, but look how much penetration we got with it. So when you, when you put that kind of a conditioning oil in the wood, you're, you're stopping warping and twisting. You're keeping that wood from busting open. You're, you're stopping all of that. So um, if you can tell a fence builder that there's a, there's a good chance we can eliminate 90% of your callbacks due to warping just by staining it. And it'll look nice. That's really a benefit right there. That's they're gonna have you on speed down. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We we've seen companies that actually say if you don't stain in 90 days, they they say you have a 90 day warranty on your fence. Once you stain it within the 90 day period, we'll bump it up to a year or five years or whatever it is. But cool. um, you might be able to come up with some kind of plan with your local fence guys to to talk yeah. about that. You know, John says great advice to you. Um, and here's another one. Justin up in Texas says uh, relationships are everything. 
hundred so percent agree. I, I I agree with that. I agree with that. What do you think the staining business is missing? What do you think uh, would make? What would you like to see the staining business turn out to be in the next five years? I mean, in our area, I would love to be able to see. I mean, I, I like the added value, the the beauty of it. My, <laughs> I say I'm a before and after junkie. I love the before and after pictures. So, uh, I mean, as far as that, I, I would love to see the added value to homes and things like that and, and the beautification of a neighborhood, uh, stuff like that. But, um I mean, I, I, I want to stain every fence that goes up. Like I said, I'm not wanting to be a multi-million dollar company, but uh, the, the neighborhoods that we work in, I, I do want to get, you know, every fence in that area to look absolutely amazing. Yeah, I agree with you. Here's another comment here for you. It says, what's up from YouTube? I don't know who that is. Type your name in the box if you can. YouTube has got a privacy thing. They don't let you let us see who that is, but... Um, take a great picture of their fence with their logo and your stain on it. And that helps sell a builder as well. That may be Marissa. You know, here's a, here's a crazy idea. Would it be unreasonable to, to ask Marissa to come on a podcast later at a later oh, date? No, not unreasonable. I, don't have, think. I would like her to tell me, like be the critic and talk about what you need to be looking for to get a stain job. Right. Going around right. and looking at it with fresh eyes and what, what guys need to be looking at. I think that would help. Because yeah. I think I think a lot of people sometimes don't know what to look for. You know, you see some new guys get into a stain group and the staining university group, and maybe they stain the fence for their first time or their tenth time, and you see little things, little details that could be improved. And and some people just don't want to say something because you know you don't want to make somebody upset or whatever. But I think it's a sure. it's a, a serious thing. You know, if if oh, we can yeah, make your job definitely. better with a little constructive criticism, I think that's a good thing. So. Yeah. And um, on that comment right there, that's that's another thing that I do for uh, like our TikTok. That, that's something new that I've gotten into here lately. And I'll, you know, I'll do the before and I'll make a video and then I'll end on their sign. And then as I start it open back up, that's what I start on their sign again and back up away from it to show the before and afters. Uh, but that's I like that. That's a great idea. So Justin says, thank you both for the support of the Nebraska National Guard with Thanksgiving turkeys, man. We've done Oh, we've yeah, dude, turkeys, that's incredible. Man. Thank you for doing it, man. Yeah, that's awesome. And I've got this comment twice, V-O-G.F-Y-I. I don't know what that means. No idea. Um, I have a pressure washing channel, and we're getting into the SSE world. Awesome. Come on. Let's do, it. let's do it. Let's talk about it. So that's awesome. Here's another one from John. I think what hurts the staining industry is the misconception that it's not necessary to do. Uh, customers need to understand that staining protects their investment, similar to oil changes on cars. Yeah, man. So, John, do it. Do uh, do a video on your website about that. How how oil? You know, you maintenance your car, you maintenance the grass, you maintenance the house. You got to maintenance the fence. I think. That's man, I, I use that analogy quite often uh, when we go to higher end fences. And I'll say, man, you built a Ferrari fence. Why would you want to put Walmart oil in it? Yeah, for real. That's that's it. That's exactly right. So I appreciate whoever let me know that that comment was spam. We blocked them out of there. So don't click the spam link. So I got them out of there. But yeah, man, that that's so true. That is so true. Um, I think a good saying for that is the job is not complete until it's finished. And uh, that's a good one to use. You know, oh, yeah. finish. Yeah. So Devil Dog says, yes, he agrees with something. Probably the turkeys. He's in the military, too. What's the best way to prevent wood damage while washing a house or roof with stronger bleach, sodium hypochlorite? Don't use bleach. <laughs> so I think he's saying if, you, if you're doing a, like a house wash and yep. there's, there's splash back on, oh. uh, on the fence, that's a tough one. I would say probably wet the fence down really good first and then tarp it somehow. Yeah, probably, probably probably the best way to go. Yeah, that's what I would do too. Actually, the best way is to go ahead and sell them on the the, the fence wash too. And that's uh, right. You'd be surprised uh, how how much business you can get with with house washes to add on the wood structures outside. And so you're like already there, way. so I mean, why not take a little extra time to make a little extra money? Yeah, yeah, treat them right. So I think that's a good one, man. You've got to have the most comments of any video we've done. People, people have been waiting awesome. for you. It sounds like. Cool. Yeah. So where can people find you if, if they want to reach out and get their fence or deck stained in the Memphis area, where do we go to look for you? At? 
uh, uh, Facebook, uh, easy stain would probably be the best, uh, to get us there. Um, my number's plastered all over the internet there on, on, you know, our Facebook page and our TikTok and all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, Facebook would probably be the best. And I mean, if you have a question, man, hit me up. I don't mind helping. We have a, a young guy that just started out that's not too far from us, uh, James and, and Olive Branch. Uh, he's probably, you know, 45 minutes or so from us. And, you know, a lot of people would take that, you know, hey, man, I don't – he's competition. I don't want to give him any information. And I, I mean, it's not competition, man. We're all in this to make money. We're all in this to support our families and to help the industry. So, uh, like, you've always told me that if you want to keep the industry standard up, you know, tell them your prices. Why Why hoard that and not give them the, your prices? Because they're going to go in and try to undercut you and, you know, mess all that up. So, yeah, yeah. We had probably our biggest competitor in our market here in our office hanging out with us this morning. So there you go. Uh, yeah. If you if you work right. Well, I mean, it doesn't matter. It's like there's the coatings business is is a it's hundreds of billions of dollars is the market yes. on it. So like, why are we going to get why are we going to worry about it? There's so much just because you get a big piece of pie doesn't mean it takes away from me. So I like right. that. And like Kenny, that. like Kenny and Mr. Walt, Mr. Walt, Mr. Kenny. I mean, they live right close together and one's a, a, a guru in one area and one's a guru in the other. So they just flip flop back and forth. And that's, you know, that's kind of what you want to do. Just become proficient in, in multiple things. But I mean, become good in, in one specific area and try to saturate that market. Yep. I agree. So Justin Menitsis asked, what can he bring us from Nebraska in February, man? I don't want a thing. I just want to see his pretty face. What about you? Are you coming to Staining University this year? I don't know. Potentially. Uh, it just depends on how our schedule is working out. We still have a completely full schedule. So uh, it kind of depends on what the weather's like. Yep. Truth Seeker says, I think we should all get on the same page with pricing. Everyone should benefit. I think everyone should get on the same page with how they structure their pricing and that they should start thinking in margins um, yes. because and instead of what the market price is, you need to think about what your market price is. Um, right. So, for instance, a lot of guys start around 50 percent margin. So if your cost of goods sold, which is your labor and materials, costs ten dollars, if you double that, that's a that's a 50 percent margin right there. So it'd be you would right. sell the, for twenty dollars and the twenty dollars, the, the ten dollars in, in gross profit would cover your overhead and, and then hopefully a little net profit when the job's done. So if everybody starts thinking in, in terms of that and learning their numbers, oh, how much how much it costs you to actually do a job, then I think pricing is no longer an issue. Because when people realize they're stealing from their family when they bid these jobs cheap or cheaper, yep. um, then then they will figure it out. Jason's from Lewisburg, man. You've got to come see us. We're not too terribly far from you. We got crews in Spring, Spring Hill and Franklin today down by you. So let's see, Joel Velez, how long can a restored fence last without being stained? It all depends, I would think. I mean, depends on the area. Uh, if we restore them, we're, we're staining them. I mean, I don't, I don't know why you would not stain it, but, uh, I mean, we've had fences where we restore and, and, you know, something come up or whatever, and you go back a month later, it's still good. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, man, I, I really appreciate you coming on. I got one last thing before we go. Tell us about the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate bringing that up. So, like most guys, I'm, I'm assuming, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I don't have a whole lot of local friends. I don't have a whole lot of people that's on the same brainwave as me, I guess you would say. No, like I'm smarter or whatever. I'm just trying to do something different, you know, have a different perspective and a different way of living. So, just try to start a group to do that. And um, it, it's a group of guys that, you know, I just – I want to surround myself with people better than me. I want to surround myself with different ideas, better ideas, um, different concepts. I mean, um, I, I'm the weird guy that's doing breathing exercises and things like that. And, uh, you know, just that that's kind of where I started that. I started that because it, it, there is a, a lack of integrity uh, in a lot of people and a lot of gentlemen and uh, I, I've seen been in the construction industry since I was 10, 11 years old, man. And, you know, I, I've seen it. it. It's and I'm not trying to down anybody in, in any industry or whatever. But I mean, that's it, it is what it is. I mean, that's just what they grew up around or whatever. And they just pick those, you know, those uh, 
nuances up themselves and, and they just think that's how they have to act. And, and that's not true. You know what I mean? I uh, just wanted to start a group for hardworking guys that were trying to better themselves every day that are trying to live a different lifestyle that aren't trying to be the norm, uh, that are trying to just be excellent, man. They're trying to do the best they can. Yeah, I like that. Why don't you, if Marissa's watching or you, just put a link to that in the comments because you you made you put me in the group and uh, I've not had a ton of time to spend in there, but I'm excited about it. I think you're doing the right thing with that. That's awesome. Appreciate it. Yeah, you are. What is it? If you you are basically what you're surrounded by. So and your that's right. They become, say the, the top five people you're around is who you become. If you show me your circle, I'll show you your future. Yeah, and so if if you. Uh, and your thoughts sort of become reality, right? What you think becomes, you know, if you start 100%. Thinking, thinking that's, negative that's, all the time, man, people, people tend to be negative. So that's right. Uh, that's even in the Bible, man, the power of words, the power of thoughts, uh, they become something you manifest things into your life. And that's, that's 100% true, man, by the way you think is who you become. Yep. So Kenny Dugan says, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Strive for growth through all facets of life. And I agree with that. That's words. 100%. Of well, let's close this thing out, man. I'm going to pitch uh, Staining University. I'm going to tell everybody about that real quick because it is a free event. And I got a crazy idea. I'm going to run it by you. You're the first person I've told about this outside the office. I want to feed a billion kids. Sounds crazy, right? Yeah, no. Nope. So, so. So we did, we do the angel tree every year. You know, you go down to the bank, you get an angel tree and we picked a family and we mm -hmm. go get coats and shoes or whatever for them. And, uh, man, we went to Walmart to get these kids some winter coats and they don't even have, they don't have winter coats at Walmart. You can't buy one. They, they're not on the shelf. Went to Target, can't find them. And man, that, that got me pretty upset. Like I was thinking, what, are, what are people doing to put warm clothes on their kids? And, uh, when I was a kid, I remember going to get a winter coat was a big deal. But when you went to get one, there was there was hundreds of them, whatever you wanted, all shapes, sizes, styles and colors. The Dallas Cowboys jacket, you know, whatever, the bomber jacket, you could get it. Can't get it no more. So um, right. it just kind of inspired me to say, hey, how can we take this Staining University event, uh, this free training and turn it into something like a charity where where we feed kids or we, we we do something for people that actually need it. We always stain stuff for veterans homes and we build fence and we do things for charity. But how can we take it to the next level? And uh, I want to do that. What do you think? Yeah, that's that's an incredible idea, man. That's one thing that we do every year. Uh, my wife and daughter <laughs> have the biggest hearts, man. If it weren't for them, I swear this house would be crumbled, but they, they, they are incredible. They do things like that constantly. Uh, I mean, as far as I can remember, man, or as long as I can remember, my little girl wanted to, she would get her birthday presents and, uh, and or excuse me, instead of her getting birthday presents on her birthday, she wants people to bring gifts so she can take to St. Jude to give the gifts there. Uh, and I mean, man, that, giving we're so fortunate anyway to be able to live in the society we live in to be able to have the lifestyle that we have all of us i mean there's no telling what you could have been born as but you were born a human being and you have you know your health you have you know we may not be the wealthiest but we have income we're not worried about money and there's not there's people out there that that are struggling for that and, you know, you can talk to them all day, but how are you going to talk to somebody with a hungry belly? You know what I mean? They're not going to listen to you. Mm -hmm. And Tony Robbins did that same thing. I mean, he wanted to – I don't know how many people he feed, feeds now a year, but it was – it's millions. But he had the same concept. And I think that's an outstanding idea, man, because there are a lot of people out here hurting nowadays. And, uh, you know, that that's, that's an incredible mm. idea. Well, I my thought is so for for one thing for this year we're going to do a little different at staining university is i'm inviting everyone to bring their their teenage kids you know they got to behave and we're not going to act wild but but i want them to bring them with no devices and i mean no no devices right no right. cell phones no ipads and i'll talk to these young people and have some other people talk to the young people in the room about tech meeting the trades because i think a lot of kids or watching the internet nowadays or TikTok and they think I want to make a million dollars a year by TikTok in or something like that. And and people can do that. They can. Yeah, that's true. But they usually can't do it for very long. Right. Um, it's not sustainable. And, and the, yeah. And the ones that do it, um, 
are very rare. Right. They're very rare. So and that takes but, work too. It's not like you're just gonna go out oh, there and share something. But I mean it takes work and dedication to do that stuff. Yeah, so it's it's one of those things where um a lot of kids are really good on social media. They're good on the tech stuff. Um, but that's not really probably going to make them a living, um, in, in most areas, but yeah. if they're really good at tech and get really good at that and they, and they tie that with a trade, like if they're a really good plumber, electrician or fence builder, or stain contractor, then it can change their life. It, it can make them to have a great living, a great income and a great business. And they can yeah. help people with that. So I want to, I want to invite, at this standing university, I want to invite young people to come to this one. And yeah, uh, that's so a good can, idea, man. Let's get this next generation excited about the trades and excited about tech in the trades. Cause, the, cause we live in a world now where it, if you're going to run a business, you can be really good, but you got to tell somebody about it. And, right. uh, so, and that's so, the thing about the, the trades is, I mean, most people are trying to go toward tech stuff, well, Vin, well, you still have to have what I consider wrench turners. The, the, the world still has to revolve around blue collar work. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you you need a plumber. You need HVAC. They're, they're not going to be able to build robots that can do this type of stuff. You know what I mean? They're trying. Don't get me wrong. I've seen that. But you, they're not going to put as much attention to detail. They're not going to make rapport with the customer while they're there. And, you know, there's no emotion in that, but yeah, my, my father always told me, man, get a trade. That's, that's why I got into welding. I didn't want to weld, yeah. but he said, learn how to weld that way. If anything ever happens to you, you can fall back on it. And that is a hundred percent the truth because yeah. for the first two or three years, that's what I did. Uh, I went to shutdowns or whatever. When in the off season, we would stay in during the season, but we hadn't built enough clientele to where we can work all the way through the winter. So that's what we did is I, I did my blue collar yeah. work. I did my, my trade. Yep, that's exactly right. So, so if we can get enough guys at this at standing university to change their family, change their family tree, bring their kids there, and and get them into a spirit of helping others, then I think we might just be able to feed a billion kids one day. So, yeah, so that's the awesome. idea. So, I'm looking for a charity. If you know of any, man, I don't, I don't want to start the charity. I just want to have the event and let's find a really good charity that the whole world trusts and that feeds kids already. And let's just see what we can do to help them out. And I think that's yeah, most definitely. Place to start. So if you've got kids come to Staining university, it's in Nashville, February 24th, 25th and 26th. It's three days. Um, it's going to be a big event. We're anticipating somewhere between 300 and 500 people this one. And wow. uh, so, so I'm excited. It's getting big and uh, I'm excited, man. I'm Great knowledge, excited. man. It's awesome knowledge. Yeah. So looks like, uh, let's see. I love the idea of starting schools is a great way to feed most children in our area. The junior auxiliary sends food home with kids on the weekend, snack, quick foods, whatever they can send home in backpacks. That's cool, man, because a lot of people go to, to uh, they want to go to Afghanistan or China to help people. And that's awesome. Those people definitely need help. But man, there's people right down the street need help. You're um, at the start where you are. Yeah. Yeah. If everybody is starting their own backyard, every, all the backyards will be covered. So hundred percent. Yeah. So we can go through these all day. looks like the comments just keep coming in, but yeah, if somebody knows about that, knows, uh, knows of a, of a good charity, man, let's do it. So that's it. Steven, you got anything you want to add to it? No, sir. I'm well, good. Well, let's go enjoy the rest of our afternoon, man. And I appreciate everybody who watched, um, all the links to everything to Steven's page, to our page, to Staining University, the sign up, uh, the field guide, all of that stuff's linked at the bottom of this. So if you need something, check it out and I'll see you soon, my friend. Yes, sir, brother. Y'all have a great day. Right, I man. appreciate it, man. Take care, Stephen. We'll see you guys. Later, Thanks. brother.